Hi, we're the Mouse versus Mole team. I'm Kai. And I'm Liz. And we'll be presenting on behalf of our teammates, uh, Nathan, Tommy, and Alan, and uh, Alex Goins, who is unfortunately not here with us today. So, <laughs> what's up? All right, the game, that we, the game that we've made actually was based on the concept of competitive mining. Essentially, we want to make a game where two players could go head to head on a 2D destructible environment and basically try to outsmart each other and kill them by knocking them into environment traps. With the use of the power-ups here, which are rocket boots and uh, our bazooka. So for the next, next slide is going to be a screenshot of the game we currently have. As you can see, the, the mole character is currently trying to kill the mouse character over with the bazooka. So, uh, let's see. Essentially, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit first about how we got from the two words competitive mining to the current game. And then, I'm gonna, and then pass, I'll pass the microphone over to Liz to talk about how our project design, project development worked. Essentially, this game was, we started this game working on this game from the start of the semester, and it went through three iterations before becoming what it is now. Version 0.1 was our paper prototype, which was basically a grid of blocks in which two players had to move across the, two, two players had to move across the grid to reach the other side, and that was the goal of the gameplay. The other goal was to kill the other player. One player could kill the other player by making, by breaking blocks out from under them and dropping them four squares. We wanted to see if this would lead to interesting player interaction, and it did, but not enough. Players kept trying to rush across the stage too quickly without interacting, and that was kind of boring. So, for the next iteration, we wanted to make the game more fast-paced, hopefully more, with more interaction. And this is our first digital prototype, version 1.0. Essentially, you can see here, the grid-based stage is still the same. You have two players on the left bottom of the stage, and the goal of this game was no longer to get to the other side, whichever the other side was, but to collect as many power-ups as you feasibly could, as represented by the stars that you can see on the grid. We were hoping that the race to get power-ups would force players to compete with, with each other to race towards power-ups and hopefully kill each other a lot more. Unfortunately, this also didn't happen because players kept running to the, their side of the board collecting all their power-ups and staying the hell away from each other until the stage broke off and they died. So that wasn't too fun either. And as a, result of, as a result of that iteration, we decided for our final version, for this version, that we would force players to interact. We would take out any other goal other than players kill each other. And to facilitate this, we would add in power-ups. As I've mentioned before, we had a bazooka, we had rocket boots, and we had a few other ones. But essentially, this was to make sure that players had to come up with interesting strategies to kill each other, to interact, and to essentially compete. We, facilitate, we made this more interesting by randomizing level generation by giving more terrain choices and to make players be able to play multiple rounds against each other. So this is one version of the concept art, the first concept art we had for version 2.0. This was actually the version that we thought we, were, we would be doing networking on in which we could have players play across the internet on the same stage with multiple players. You could see only your own screen and your own player and your own power-ups here, but there would be other players all on the same stage trying to kill you and hopefully be the last person standing. Unfortunately, once we realized that networking was way too much of a hassle to get done in six weeks, we decided to move on to two players at the same computer, and this is a version of what that would have looked like in prototype uh, format. So, without further ado, I'll pass the stage over to Liz to talk about how our project development worked. Sure. So in terms of how our project uh, progressed over the term, uh, initially started with a group of two people working on a paper prototype, and then they expanded over to, I think, five people working on a small digital prototype. And then finally, we ex added a, fifth, a sixth person, and we ended up in our final team size. We're the smallest team in the class of six people. Um, Kai worked on design and art. I worked on project management and on code reviews and general wrangling. And then we had Alan working on the sound and on the dynamic music generation. Uh, the music in, uh, in the levels is custom generated in terms of having the soundtrack depend upon what's going on in the game. And then lastly, we have three people who worked on the core gameplay, um, which would namely be Nathan, Alex, and Tommy. So how did we actually make this work? Well, we met three times a week, usually for about half an hour each time, and we basically kept it really simple. We went over the high priority bugs, we checked on the status of the things people were doing, 
But we spent most of the time really talking about open design questions that we had. Um, containers things like, you know, should we have the stage fall away from the users? How can we convey that the, there is a pit of death rising up towards the users? Um, so virtually all of these kinds of deep design questions, we decided entirely by consensus with everyone involved so that everyone was on the exact same page. This worked because our team was so small. And then smaller things we ended up deciding via email or via updating the issue tracker, where it was just something minor that a couple of people could get agreement on quickly. So over the course of our project, um, we had over 200 bugs that we created, and we thankfully closed all of them about two days before the project was due. Um, so we started off with a big list sorted from priority zero must be done tomorrow or the day after bugs, all the way down to wish list uh, priority four bugs that we thought we'd never get to. And as we finished bugs, we'd go and promote a few more bugs to be more important. And we just ticked things off and off and off until everything was done. Um, so one of the things that we did was we didn't pair program for the most part. Um, everyone worked on the coding or on the art or on the music independently. And then we used a check-in system to have every single line of code reviewed by someone else on the team before it went in. So this meant that we had at least one person who was at least two people who were familiar, who were familiar with each piece of code. Um, the one exception was when we did the big port from one game engine to another, we worked together as the programming team on that because we wanted everyone to be familiar with the base state of the code once it had been ported over. So this is a picture of our issue tracker. Um, obviously, you can see that we've got code reviews going back and forth, lots and lots of comments, and a bunch of sorted priority things that we thought we needed to get done. So we basically assigned things based on who was available, um, who had the most expertise at a specific thing, and it worked out fairly well. Um, we spread the load pretty evenly, and nobody felt particularly overloaded. We didn't intend originally to say, you know, you are going to be responsible for the bazooka feature from the beginning of the game to the end of the game. Instead, it kind of organically developed that someone would start working on the bazooka, and then if there was a bug with the bazooka, they would probably get the bug unless they were super busy. So one important thing that we did was we started off using Game Query, which was a JavaScript-based engine similar to jQuery. Um, and it was OK, but it was not great. It did not support uh, camera controls. It did not support animations as fully as we would like. So we ended up switching over to Crafty as our game engine for version 2.0. And that also helped a lot with performance. But we'll get into performance a little bit later. So as I mentioned, we did peer review on all of our code. And initially, it was a little bit contentious. Um, we had some disagreements over coding style. We had some disagreements over how nitty gritty we should get. And eventually, we ended up sorting those issues out. And we ended up finding small bugs, saying, here's a bug. OK, I'll fix it quickly. And then we got it checked in, and everything was happy. So back to Kai for the conclusions. So we definitely learned a lot from the course of working on this game. Some of it bad, um, actually a lot of it good. But we'll talk about the bad things first. So I mentioned networking earlier when I was talking about the prototypes of our game. And the networking we decided we had wanted to implement because it would be a lot easier for one player to just have the entire keyboard to himself and play. But after a while, we realized that, well, networking would add so much extra overhead time to every other feature we wanted to implement, testing it, making sure there were no bugs with parallel things, it was, it was too much of a hassle. So we scrapped networking. But when we scrapped networking, something else came up, and that something was keyboard lockout. Because now that we had two players trying to actively hit buttons on the same keyboard, most keyboards can't handle that many key presses at the same time without one key interfering with some other key on the same area of the keyboard. So that led to us having some really weird and interesting bugs where players could, lock, could effectively prevent the other player from jumping or shooting their bazooka just by holding down all their keys at once or trolling. I mean, and, theoretic, and we didn't want players to settle arguments by punching each other. So we, we, had to, we had to do a lot of key tweaking, controls tweaking for that to work out. And as a result of that, we had to cut out two of the power-ups that we had originally wanted to do just because we didn't have enough keys to be able to select them easily enough. That was one trade-off we had to make because of mechanical issues. The other one was that JavaScript, while really good for making games easily accessible on all platforms, is not really an is not very effective as a processing heavy game engine. We, the, our game was really slow for a lot of its life cycle just because of loading all of the blocks on the screen, making everything destructible, and we had to write a lot of optimization code to handle that sort of thing. So that was, those were the bad parts of the project. But the, I think the good parts outweighed those. 
for one, our team, which was, we basically started working almost from the start of the semester. Our team worked together really well. Even without the person, even with the personality conflicts, that got resolved quickly. We figured out who had the best skills for what type of thing on the project, and we could assign tasks quickly and easily without resorting to more rigid project management things like scrums or sprints or what have you. We also didn't have, we also made a decision to not include way too many features in our game so that we didn't have to go through the cold crunch or death march as some people would know it of staying up multiple all-nighters trying to finish features before some deadline or other. Not a single one of us worked over Thanksgiving, for instance. We decided <laughs> we wanted to set the time aside and we did. Yep. Yeah, that was, that was fun. And we always, we always had a working version of the code which made everyone happy because it meant we could always have something to turn in. And we tested all of our code thoroughly with code reviews so that nothing was ever inescapably broken. So, next step, so the next step for our game, I'll let Liz. Sure. So what's going to happen next with our game is we're going to pretty much immediately uh, make the current state of development available as a free-to-play online game. Um, it's available off of our GitHub site. And it runs on all platforms. Um, it performs best with Chrome, also works OK in Firefox. And to our surprise, it works in Internet Explorer 10, although sound doesn't work because AUG is broken in Internet Explorer 10. Um, so our co we are intending to maintain the current version, at least, as open source. Um, it is MIT licensed as far as the code goes. And our media is going to be uh, Creative Commons non-commercial licensed. And further development is kind of up in the air. Um, if you send us a pull request, we'll probably respond to it. Um, we're not sure whether we want to continue development on the, on the project, though. So with that, um, I think we're going to do a gameplay demo and play best of five or best of seven or whatever our intrepid uh, team members feel like, feel like doing. Is the keyboard working now? So first, let's take a quick moment to look at the controls. Um, so as you can see, the players are moving left and right and digging up and jumping. And there's a double jump that activates the rocket boots. And there's a hold and aim in order to activate the bazooka. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, do we have the sound working? OK, so let's see. Over on the right-hand side, the mouse is using the bazooka in order to break large chunks in order to get up more quickly. And it's activating rocket boots uh, in order to traverse up through the vertical gap that's been created. Uh-oh, uh-oh, uh-oh. Oh, so close, so close, so close. Does he have enough boost left? Yes, he does. Excellent. Meanwhile, on the left-hand side, uh, the mole is currently attempting to collect as many power-ups as he can. And now they're starting to shoot at each other. Oh! And now the mole makes it to the top, and the mouse is left to struggle to try to reach the top before the lava gets blown up. Now, as you see there, um, the rocket, the uh, sorry, the bazooka can be used as a defensive weapon as well in order to blast yourself up and get out of a trap where you wouldn't otherwise have rocket boots. Uh oh, things are not looking so good for the mouse there. Not looking so good for the mouse at all, except for the mole has run out of ammo. And now let's see. I would say that the mole is in the better position right now because the lava is all the way at the top and the mole has many more rocket boot uh, charges. Aww. All right, round two. So you can look over on the left and the right to see what keys are being pressed by the players. So that way, if, you don't, if you're not sitting, standing behind them, seeing what they're doing, you can still get an idea of what they're doing. Let's see what's going on here. Uh, we have the mouse who is collecting a few of the red power-ups in order to power the jetpack. Um, on the left-hand side, uh, the mole is going and digging uh, the conventional way. And meanwhile, the mouse is using the bazooka ammo in order to dig faster up to the top. And soon, we'll have the two players meeting in the middle. And uh-oh, the mouse's maneuver backfires. And he finds himself. Oh! <laughs> Mouse is, was briefly out of ammo, but they now both have ammo, and they're now going to start shooting at each other. Uh-oh, uh uh-oh! So close, so close. The mouse is in trouble. So is the mole. Do they have enough ammo t to make it? That's the question. 
The mouse is saving his ammo, and the mole nearly hits the mouse, but doesn't succeed. What will happen? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> now it's a race to run out the rocket boot charges. And the mole loses. This time they're slugging it out. Oh, shoot. <laughs> Uh, oh, that was a blunder. <laughs> oh, I got it. Lost it. So, let's play best of five. Let's play best of five. So, two more games left. Oh, wow. so close to it, letting a direct hit. <laughs> so if the mouse wins this one, he'll win the best of five. Oh, you killed the power up. Oh. Uh oh, the mouse is out of charges, the mouse is out of ammo. The mole has. Oh, 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 nice save. Very nice save. And this time, the mouse is going to win, barring a sudden change in circumstances. And good game, mouse. So, that is mouse versus mole. Are there any questions? Let's go ahead and close that. Uh, yes, yes, I can. Um, let's exit full screen, we can show. So it is at uh, my GitHub um, slash mouse versus mole. LindsayGray.github.com slash mouse dash vs dash mole. Yes, so I just want to ask if you feel that like, the lava level was uh, rising too quickly. Uh, we have Th played around with the numbers. We think the current iteration might be a little quick, but it seems playable. Most of our earlier play tests had the lava slower than this, and we slowly inched it up until players stopped <laughs> saying that they didn't even realize the lava was rising. I <laughs> <laughs> Is there any dominant strategy other than, uh, I, by, by that I mean, is there is there a, a counter strategy to always just going to the top with as much rocket power as you manage and then floating until uh, the end? We were playing relatively passively early. Um, you can try to play a more deny style, like chase them and blow up their power-ups as they get close to them, or try mm -hmm. to last hit their power-ups, because it's the person who does the last hit on the power-up that gets it. Yeah, we did a lot of playtesting before like this big presentation even started, and we actually started getting more aggressive in the later games after we had gotten more used to everything again. Like, it seems like really early you get killed by the lava before you can dig two up, and then you start getting used to it a little, and then you start just going straight to the top with as many power-ups as you can find. And then after a while, you start trying to actually kill your opponent before they can even get to the top. More aggressive strategies seem to be more mechanically difficult to execute because your aim has to be better. But if done right, they're more guaranteeable. Yeah. Yeah, the anti-turtling strategy is to shoot your opponent out of the sky. <laughs> yeah, there, there, it's not like there isn't one meta that we have to follow. It just, those games went that way. They don't have to go that way. Um, what were some of the other power-ups, and how did they change your game uh, in your previous iterations? Microphone. So one power-up 
other powers we actually had before were a grappling hook was meant to help you navigate the level a lot, e a lot more quickly because um, from the first iterations, people were complaining about not being able to jump to the top of the stage enough. We decided that the rocket boots uh, got rid of that particular uh, need. So that was left out. Another power up that we threw around but never actually implemented was the power up that you could leave a trail of blocks behind you as you run ran around the stage. This was meant to be a sort of blockade mechanism. Maybe you could, these blocks were meant to be semi-indestructible so that your opponent had to take a long time to get, to get through them. And maybe they would be blocking off his access to power ups that he needed, which would, I guess, have also prevented the jump to top of stage rocket boot forever thing. But yeah, those were some of the ideas for power ups that we had. Also, we had the drill in which you could place an item that would go and immediately tunnel directly down to the bottom. And if your opponent happened to be standing in the path of that, then they would also fall down to the bottom because all of the blocks would be cut out from under them. But we ended up playtesting and finding that the rocket boots plus the bazooka were enough in order to ensure good player interaction, and we kind of didn't have to go to the additional complexity. In particular, the drill was not implemented because we found through playtesting that it was actually best to start people as low as possible, such that if someone even got high enough for the drill to be useful, they would already have too distinct of an advantage against the other player. How are the levels created? Are they the same? Like you pay three rounds, or is it, is it? They were different. It's generated before every. Wow, yeah, really Tommy can explain how how the level levels works. Yeah, there there's like caves and there's like tunnels between them, and it's just randomly generated. What? So there's basically a hole punching function and like a tunnel yeah. to next hole function, and yeah. like it's. It's randomly generated, but with a base as like two holes around the player's starting locations. Mm -hmm. um, so we also made sure that you can't be j spawned immediately over a pit of lava. But um, uh, but besides that, it's it's random all over the place. Yeah, it's not the same stage every time. So um, looking at the control scheme where you press down the button and then you release to fire. That looks like you would have a lot of ghosting issues. One of the um, the design aspects we had to change over game was the charging slingshot because players holding down two keys at the same time on the keyboard would introduce terrible ghosting. It was impossible to aim. So how do you deal with this uh, problem when two people are playing on the same computer? Do you have some way around this or do you just use a better keyboard? So we actually switched to this control scheme because of the ghosting issue. Um, before this, we had been throwing around ideas such as you have two dedicated keys to aim the bazooka, um, but like then we switched to only having one key for the bazooka, which is reduce the ghosting issues, um, and we can also position that one key so that we minimize like interference. Like we chose uh, C and space because they were like the least likely to cause issues. Um, so even though you're holding it down more, um, we found that it still cr creates fewer issues. Yeah, the other change that we made was we made it so that if uh, players were previously holding down the jump key in order to repeatedly get jumps, um, but we made it so that if you hold, tap, hold down the jump key, you only get one jump out of it. You have to tap it repeatedly. No, so that we were able to change that back. Yeah. Oh, we changed that back. Yeah, okay. we were able to change that back. That's um, yeah. Because we selected. We used because we selected keys. yeah the arrow keys um, instead of we originally had it as uh, I J K L. And N was uh, player two's fire button, but because of the ghosting issues that we came up with uh, from that, we switched to the arrow keys in space for player two. And I don't think it ghosts on any of our keyboards if people are not intentionally mashing down more keys than their players can enact actions at once. Yeah, the arrow keys are relatively isolated like, from most keyboards. I, I think you can cause ghosting if you just hold down, like, W, A, S, D, and C at once, you may be able to stop your player two from doing anything, but that, that's intentionally being a jerk, so. <laughs> and that's resolved by punching the person next to you. We actually had <laughs> issues running um, two keys pressed down at the same time, two special keys that were part of a control scheme would disable one player's jump, so it was very, very annoying. But I'm glad you guys worked around that. Yeah. Okay, well, that's the last presentation of the day, so uh, give all the teams a big hand. <laughs>